With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, Heard Tell Show. Okay, the streak continues. The most appearances by any one guest in the history of the herd tell program, which goes all the way back to last fall, <laughs> Michael Siegel, that's Dr. Michael Siegel to you. Usually we have him on to talk science and we are going to do that later on in our conversation, but we're actually going to start out with some politics because happens to be one of the hot primaries, one of the most watched primaries in your backyard, the great state and Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, my friend, how are you? And are you surviving the primary season? I'm doing well. I'm surviving the primary season mainly by uh, sticking to the oldie station and turning off the TV. Now, you would think people would advertise on the oldie station because that's a that's a demographic. Old people vote. People that like, you know, the four tops and spinners, they're still out there. They can still go punch a ticket. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of where I got into this, that there were there, there was a, a rare political ad that was actually an anti Mastriano ad. And I started looking into it and the claims in the ad were kind of misleading, but the more I got into researching Mastriano, the more concerned I got that he's uh, currently leading the polls. Yeah. So normally we have you on, we talk science, we talk culture. Um, you've been kind of our go-to doing the yeoman's work on the COVID stuff, not only because of you, but because uh, your wonderful and talented wife has a deep knowledge area in this. So you've just been carrying the ball for ordinary dash times on a lot of things. But you're going to talk a little politics today because you are a man of many parts and many talents and you're just that smart. Uh, so before we get back to you flying your spacecraft and so forth, let's talk about this Pennsylvania political thing. You actually wrote Ordinary-Times.com, Doug Mastriano. I'm trying to think. I think this is the first time you've wrote a political piece on one particular individual that I remember. Um, let's start with just the billboard on him because, and you opened the piece this way, on paper, he looks like a pretty solid, normal run-of-the-mill candidate, and then you start scratching the surface, or more importantly, he starts opening his mouth and talking. Yeah, um, so we have Tom Wolf, our former governor, is, uh, is leaving office this year, and so we have an open seat. Um, the likely Democratic nominee has been settled for a while. That's uh, Josh Shapiro. He's the current uh, attorney general, um, and he's pretty much down the line left of center, Dem, uh, sort of imagine Joe Biden, but uh, who can keep his mouth under control and keeps kosher as well. Um, you know, very law and order type, but does favor legalized pot. Um, he was part of the Hail Mary suit, um, defending Pennsylvania against the lawsuits that were brought by the other states to force reconsideration of the votes in other states. Um, hit uh, something that was important to me, which was there was a specious statistical argument used in the lawsuit that the chance that Trump lost the election was one in a quadrillion, and it was obviously garbage, but kind of tricky to explain, and he explained it pretty well. Um, and has forced a couple of Democrat reps actually to resign from the legislature for corruption issues. And he's got the domination log locked down, and uh, he the election should be, uh, as we're recording this tomorrow, and he should have that locked up. The Republican side, though, is a lot more open. Uh, the main candidate for a while was Lou Barletta. He has most of the major endorsements. Um, he was born and raised in Hazleton, PA, was a mayor and then a representative. He's fairly moderate on most issues. I mean, is towing the Trump line on elections and stuff like that, but is you know pretty much a standard Republican. And you also have William McSwain, who searched for a while. Uh, he was a U.S. attorney appointed by Trump, but he's been fading in the polls. And he chased Trump's endorsement, but Trump wouldn't give it to him because he said he was a coward for not pursuing fraud charges while he was USA. But uh, the surging to the head of the polls now, and now leading by about 10 points, is Doug Mastriano. And like I said in the piece, on paper, you know, he's a veteran of two wars. He's an author of history books. You know, he's, he was only been in politics a few years. So it's kind of the sort of person who would appeal to people. But the more you look at him, the more concerned you get. Um, there are, he has been cleaning up his social media presence, but there were uh, anti-Islam posts. There were QAnon posts. Um, various accusations. 
There was a New Yorker piece about a year ago that said he was aligning with Christian nationalist elements. He denies that uh, very fiercely, but uh, that's still a point of contention. Um, he was came under heavy criticism last year because he organized six buses of his supporters to go to the Capitol to protest the on January 6th to protest the vote. Now he said he left when the violence began. There's video showing him still there. Um, so it's there's a little bit of contention over that. And some people said he should have been kicked out of the legislature. That obviously didn't happen. And uh, he was one of the biggest people who was organizing that effort to have um, po Republican politicians meet in Gettysburg with Rudy Giuliani and try to override the will of the voters and appoint a slate of Republican electors to vote for Donald Trump in January of 2021. And so that's uh, caused a lot of controversy. Um, he's also a COVID-19 skeptic. At first, he wanted the to suspend HIPAA so that people who had COVID-19, their names would be known so that, and that was, that he's been hit on that. But he then became a down the line skeptic opposing vaccine mandates, opposing mask mandates, that sort of thing. And if you look at his endorsements, it's kind of a who's who of conspiracy theorists. It's Mike Lindell, um, and Donald Trump, obviously, um, Rudy Giuliani, um, Mike Flynn. You know, this is, and I think more people are getting concerned. And the Republican establishment is concerned about him, but they've kind of responded a little too late. Um, a few candidates dropped out, but there's not enough to overcome this. And one of the problems here is that Pennsylvania you can get a nomination with the plurality. And so if he wins 25, 30% of the electorate, he'll be the nominee, even though most people are opposed to them. Now, I talked to our mutual friend, Joseph Zemanski about this. And you know, he pointed out that the undecideds are still kind of large in this race, but I think it's now gotten to the point where the undecideds are almost not enough to overcome the advantage. So I think it's quite likely that Mastriano will be the Republican nominee. And if that happens, then we have someone in the governor's office with a almost certainly Republican legislature who has said that he would basically override the will of the voters uh, if the election was close and he thinks there's fraud. Yeah. And Joe Zemanski, our friend, we're going to have him on later in the week after the primaries for this Tuesday. Uh, he's from Pennsylvania. So this is his baby of a race to pay attention to. He knows what he's talking about. Why do you think it is? Because you live there, you're plugged in there, you teach at university there. Um, nationally, the Senate race is getting way more attention because obviously, you know, with the House pretty much probably gone at this point for the Democratic Party, the Senate's where the fight is to see if they can hold on to the Senate. Um, but locally, statewide, is the governor's race getting the kind of juice and attention the Senate race and the congressional races are? Or uh, what is, is it Tom Wolf uh, fatigue just because he's kind of been the governor for a while and it's an open seat? Why do you think the governor's race isn't getting as much attention as those other races? Or is it and we're just not seeing it nationally? I, I think um, it's only recently that it that it got that kind of attention. I think most people assumed it would be Barletta versus Shapiro, who are both pretty mainstream candidates. And uh, and, you know, Shapiro might have the edge a little bit, but this is a very purple state depending on how the Democrats do nationally, that could flip things. Um, I think that the surge of Mastriano towards the front of the pack uh, has really suddenly drawn attention to this race that is very, very important, not just for the people of Pennsylvania, but um, for national implications as well. I got to ask you this question. And I, and I look, I, I'm asking this as a, <laughs> as a point of order, not because I know, don't know the answer. At what point, do we have to say a Mastriano is kind of more of a mainstream Republican because this is not an insignificant lead he has. This is not out of the realm of other races, Senate and governor races that we're seeing of people who say basically the same things he says. He's backed by Trump. The Trump endorsement here cannot be overstated. This isn't an isolated incident. At some point, we got to be like, look, this is a big chunk of the Republican Party. This is not I don't know if we call it mainstream, but it sure as heck ain't abnormal anymore. No, I don't think so. I mean, he's getting 25, 30 percent of the polls. That's not, you know, a fringe candidate. I, I do think if uh, you had a runoff election here or you had to get a majority that it's likely that he would not get it, that the rest of the Republican Party would unite behind another candidate, most likely Barletta. But if you can have a very vocal plurality in a political party, you can control that party. I mean, we've seen that. I mean, it's not just a recent phenomenon. We've seen that over and over again through American history, but a very motivated plurality 
can dominate politics in a way that a divided majority can't. Yeah, and there's no runoff again in Pennsylvania like they are in some of these other really close Senate races like North Carolina, like other places. Okay, let's talk about that Senate race for just a second, because this is one of the most bonkers wide open Senate races I can ever remember. Usually it's one side or the other side's wide open. Man, both sides are wide open. Uh, Let's deal with one uh, breaking story. Uh, Fetterman, the lieutenant governor, apparently suffered a stroke over the weekend. First and foremost, we just hope his health is where it sounds like they were able to do the clot busting drug and he will be okay pretty quickly, but still very scary stuff there. But that's just the latest in a long string of really crazy stuff that is happening in the Senate race. You're actually there. You're seeing the TV commercials when you're not listening to oldies radio. Uh, where, where's this race at for the local folks like you in Pennsylvania? Because nationally looking in, this thing looks like just a crazy turn. Well, the, the, Fetterman's going to win the Democratic nomination. I'm pretty, it's pretty clear. He has a huge lead in the polls. Uh, he's popular with the base. You know, he's uh, he's kind of the opposite of Shapiro or McCormick, who will be probably be, who's running for the Republican nomination. He dresses casually. He wears sweats. He, you know, wants to has been talking about legalized pot. He's very famous for having a big beard and fighting with Republicans on Twitter over the election. Um, I think he's almost certainly going to win the nomination tomorrow, barring any disaster. Um, like you said, he did have a stroke. The it does seem like it was caught early. Um, his wife noticed he wasn't doing too well. He was having AFib and uh, that caused a stroke. But we'll see how that goes uh, for the for the general. The Republican side, though, is very divided. I mean, you have McCormick, who was raised in Pennsylvania, veteran of the Gulf War, served in the Bush administration, very mainstream Republican, one of the few to say he holds Trump responsible for what happened on January 6th, which, of course, was the reason he never got an endorsement. Um, Dr. Oz has been sucking all the air out of the room. And I think you asked why the governor's race isn't getting that much attention. I think because Oz has been getting all the attention. He's a celebrity. He's been endorsed by Trump. He's actually has a slight lead in the polls right now. And if I were a betting man, I would bet that he wins the Republican nomination. I don't think McCormick's support is strong enough to overcome that Trump endorsement. The big news recently has been the surge of Kathy Barnett to the front of the pack. And she's been running for a year but uh, she's a talk show host on a, on a Christian radio station commentator, um, was very critical of Trump four years ago, but is now a full Trump supporter. Um, she's gotten a lot of criticism lately because they've dug up some anti-Muslim and LGBT tweets, but she denies having said it or say it was out of context and so forth. Her, the only endorsement she had up until this point was Mike Flynn. Um, but Trump has said that she'd never win an election. If she did, she would be, I think, the first black Republican woman in the Senate. Um, so that's interesting, but she's really in the last two weeks, come on, a couple of weeks, come on strong. She's got an infusion of money from some people and, uh, is really running a very aggressive campaign. And that's kind of put some panic into the Republican party because Oz, you know, even with the Trump endorsement, the feeling is that he wouldn't be too far out of the mainstream. Um, and he's got some wacky medical ideas, but I think politically he'd fall in line with most of the Republican party, wherever they're going at that moment. Uh, McCormick obviously is a very mainstream Republican. Fetterman's very much a uh, wild card. So uh, not Fetterman. Uh, Barnett is very much a wild card. So nobody really knows what she do. And the perception is that she has too many liabilities to be to win a close race. This is the open seat that Pat Toomey is leaving. Um, Toomey did endorse someone early, but his endorsement carries no weight in this state because he voted for to impeach Donald Trump. So uh, he's port, sort of persona non grata among the Republican base. Um, Barnett, it should be noted, is getting heavily attacked by the Trump people. Uh, yep. Very, It's getting really ugly, quite frankly, uh, especially over the weekend. They're calling into question her military service. They're bringing up all sorts of things. Uh, that's that's going to get ugly right on down to the wire on this. Let me just ask you, because I'll give you my opinion. I'm not in Pennsylvania. I'm not voting on this race. Uh, Oz is a complete non-starter with me because of his deep, well-documented ties with uh, Erdogan and Turkey. Um, is that playing locally? I know the uh, Oz people are trying to deflect that, but now there's news out that he voted in a Turkish election as recently as 2018. Is this something at the end of the race that might start swaying it? Because he's not up by all that much, couple swing points, and there's quite a lot of undecided in this race, as our buddy Joe pointed out. I think this is completely unpredictable. It's a three-way tie. I mean, Barnett, the problem is her surge was late. She was a fringe candidate up until a few weeks ago, so she's never no one's ever done the op research on her. So when you read articles, I was reading articles about her this morning and every article says 
She did this according to her website. She was this according to her website. She was that according to her website. They're all going to her website to see what her biography is because no one's actually done any op research on her. And so that's what I think is scaring the Republicans. I, if she wins the nomination, I, they will rally up and back her. I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that. I mean, the only candidate that they've turned on in recent years was Roy Moore. And even that was kind of, you know, shady, a little bit shady at times. But um, I, I, if she wins, they will back her. But I'm, I'm not, I think if you have, hold my gun to my head and say, make a prediction, I'm going to say it's Oz, just because he has the name recognition. But any of these three candidates can win. Nothing would surprise me coming out of this race. Does Oz win the general election? I don't want to make a prediction that way. It's it, the There is so much yet to happen in politics. It depends on what's going on with inflation. It depends on what's going on with the economy. It depends on what's going on with the Biden administration. I think it's going to be close enough that that you could call it, call it a toss-up. And I think most, the last time I checked, most of the uh, sites had it as a, as a toss-up. I think it's going to be a very crazy race if it's Fetterman versus Oz, because you're talking about two very outsized personalities uh, that have uh, a lot of stuff people can go after. Yeah, and it's one of the rare seats that the Democrats think they can get in the Senate, so it's going to be all hands to the palm trying to win that race. All oh, right. yeah. I'm expecting by November, this is going to be between the governor's race and the Senate race. This is going to be the center of a lot of national tension. Yeah, I agree with you. This and Georgia are the two I've been saying from the beginning. Those are going to be kind of the the watermarks on where we're going with this stuff. All right. That was Michael Siegel, Pennsylvania resident. When we come back from the break, we're going to go to Dr. Michael Siegel, flyer of spacecraft and knower of astrological things, because he's just beside himself giddy with one of the biggest uh, scientific discoveries in quite some time. I'll let him explain it. Uh, We may know what's at the middle of the center of the universe. No, it's not our political leaders who all seem to think they are. We actually have some imaging. We'll talk about that with Dr. Michael Siegel when we come back on Hardtail right after this. Now let me see you go off like a bomb. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, in the best of the Star Trek movies, Star Trek V, where they went to the center of the universe and asked God why he needed a starship, uh, Dr. Michael Siegel, we actually got a glimpse at the center of the galaxy here in the last few days. Um, I'm making a little bit of light of it, but this is actually a really, really, really big deal scientifically. And it? it's right over your left shoulder. Uh, it looks like kind of other way. There you go. Military left, my friend. Military left. Um, it, it, it looks like a blurry round image. This is a really big, um, I don't even know. You quantify it for me. How big a deal in science is this? Um, it's a pretty big deal. So the story here is that when radio astronomy was invented a century ago, um, they turned their radio telescopes to the sky and there was something very loud in the direction of Sagittarius, the constellation Sagittarius. And took decades to figure out what it was, but what they figured it out was that they think it's a very massive black hole. Black, most black holes that we deal with in the nearby universe come from stars. The giant stars collapse, they leave behind this core that's so dense that not even light can escape, and that's a black hole. But it turns out almost all galaxies have a supermassive black hole in their core, weighing millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. And these were created in the early universe. Black holes move towards the center of these galaxies, form these massive leviathons. For a long time, they're gobbling up material. They form these massive disks of material swirling into them that are so hot and bright, they can outshine the entire galaxy. But then they mature, they settle down, and they go quiet. Um, Ours has been estimated to be about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And when I did my Um, senior thesis in college back in the late uh, Triassic, um, I did my, it on the galactic center and the, we had indirect evidence that there was a black hole there. And then some scientists measured the motions of stars and seeing how much gravity they were responding to. And uh, this won a Nobel prize a couple of years ago, because they found out that 
They were orbiting something that was dark, didn't give off a lot of light, but way 4 million times the mass of the sun, that can only be a massive black hole. So the new result is that these, this, the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a whole bunch of radio telescopes all over the world, that combine their signals so they can resolve detail as though it were a telescope as big as the planet, uh, image the center of our galaxy. And they see what you see in this image, if you Google it, or if you're watching on the video, it's a, like a ring of orange light. That is a accretion disk, a disk of material swirling into the black hole. And so that's, you, you, then you see this dark center, that's the shadow of the black hole. It looks like a donut. And in fact, in honor of it, uh, Krispy Kreme had a free donut day on Friday, uh, free glazed donut day. And then you see lumps in it from material that's, that's being absorbed. And so this is, the black holes, while they are very heavy, they're small, almost by definition. If you compress the sun to a black hole, it would be the size of the earth. If you compress the earth to a black hole, it would be the size of a baseball. If you compress me to a black hole, it'd be, I'd be the size of an atom. You know, what defines a black hole isn't so much how much mass it has, but how compact it is. And this thing is smaller than the orbit of Venus. And it's 25,000 light years away. And so to resolve that kind of detail is just unbelievable. Now, talk, talk to us in, in ways we can understand here. The theory of all this was we knew there had to be something powerful at the center of the galaxy because, lack of a better way of explaining it, all this stuff is spinning and rotating, so there's got to be a pivot point there somewhere. So yep. the theory behind all this was there has to be something, black hole or otherwise, with enough uh, gravitational force behind it to make all this giant uh, galactic mechanisms work. So we kind of knew what this was. How do we go from that theory to looking at that blurry donut, you call it? And then are you working backwards from the picture to the theory? Are you going from the theory to the donut? Just practically speaking, how do you approach something that is so big uh, theoretically like this? Well, the theory came along a few decades ago when we realized there was something very compact. I mean, we've known a black, we've known theoretically about black holes for a century. We've been able to detect them by that material swirling. I mean, black holes are black, they don't give off light, but that material swirling into them gives off enormous amounts of light. So we first detected those in the 1960s. And the spacecraft I work with does a lot of studies of black holes uh, this way. But the one in the galactic center was so far away and shrouded in so much dust and gas in between us and the black hole, and just so small that we couldn't you know, see it directly like this. And so that motivated the theory, motivated the observations, but this telescope they've built, this collaboration, the Event Horizon Telescope is just so powerful. It can address issues like this and get us direct images. And by getting these direct images, we understand a lot more about how these accretion disks work, how black holes work, how galaxies are powered and so forth. So there's, I mean, it's not just a pretty picture. There's enormous amount of confirmation of science coming out of this, there are aspects of the theory of relativity that were confirmed by this image. We can measure how fast, I mean, thing, this, things around this black hole orbit on the time scale of days to months. So we can actually see things moving around here. And they're hoping with more data, we can actually get a movie showing the material swirling into the black hole. I mean, that's something that before you only saw in bad Disney movies, and now we're gonna see it for real. What's the what's the time span we're looking at? Because I know people watched Interstellar and they they joked about, you know, hey, this maneuver is going to cost us 40 years and this sort of stuff. When you're talking about minute delays and stuff, that what's the actual time you're talking about when you see something swirling around an event horizon like that? Is it that simple? Is it like, oh, well, you go another inch in and that's a year? Or is it really on a simple scale like that? Well, the, the theory of general relativity predicts that gravity slows down time. When, you know, and this is confirmed every day. You have a phone, I have a phone, you have a GPS. The GPS satellites are 20,000 kilometers up. They have to correct their clocks because time passes more slowly for us on the surface of the earth than it does 20,000 miles away. So the closer you get to a gravitational force, the slower time runs. So that's what in the movie Interstellar they're doing. When they get close to the black hole, time passes much more slowly for them. So back on earth, 50 years are passing where only minutes are passing for them. And eventually when you get to the event horizon, time stops completely as far as we know. 
And so, yeah, we see things from our perspectives, our objective perspective happening on minutes or hours timescales near the, the center of the black hole. Whereas if you were there, these would be taking years or even centuries uh, for these events to transpire. It's one of those mind-bending concepts that time is not a constant. We, you were used to time as being just a series of moments, but time is a dimension like space. It can be distorted by gravity, by motion, by other things. That was the breakthrough, the real conceptual breakthrough Einstein made that time is a thing, not just the passage of, of seconds. Yeah, and you've written about it before, and I think it's kind of it's very lyrical and beautiful, but you said astronomy really is almost like looking backwards in time more than a science of what you're actually looking at and observing. Yeah, we um, see this this black hole as it was 26,000 years ago. Wow, that's that that makes my head hurt. I'm glad there's <laughs> smart people like you to explain these things to me. Dr. Michael Siegel, uh, astronomer. See, I went through a whole interview without, without calling it astrology. I'm very proud of myself. Usually I slip up at least once. Um, <laughs> you do great work, sir. He's so legit that when we first started recording, he said, hold on a second. I got to send the command of the spacecraft real quick. He's that good. Uh, talking a little politics today, which is a little different. You do great work. Tell folks where they can find your writing and follow you on social media. My friend, as the street continues as the most vested and saw and seen and heard of the herd tell guests uh you just go to uh, www.ordinary-times.com i write there uh, usually at least once a week with throughput which is on science occasionally about uh politics and from there you can find me on twitter and other places and uh of course always a pleasure to be here yeah and you're the absolute best my friend everything he does at ordinary times is fantastic read his stuff make sure you check out his youtube channel because he reviews uh movies for science fiction purposes if they're scientifically accurate does great work michael siegel my friend uh great work on the griddle on the twitter supper club by the way i've been watching that uh talk again soon my friend all right no problem thank you sir 